is going to be a regular installment. So we're titling the series, It Takes a Village. We held our first one uh, two weeks ago and, and subsequently we'll have on our next one coming up in September, September 11th. And the intent of these is to bring in community, build community, um, offer insights as to things that are going on or, or therapies, um, kind of suggestions from experts. Uh, and then once every couple of months, we want to do something that we're kind of labeling as a town hall. And that's what this forum is, is meant to be and mimic. And it's going to be very casual. And so the kind of rundown of a town hall is we want to bring on someone, uh, whether it's someone uh, who is a parent of a child um, with Klaifstra, or whether it's someone like Zoe, who is very involved with the community, and kind of do these uh, fireside chats. But then also we want to leave space during these discussions to allow everybody to come on camera and have open dialogue about things that are top of mind, uh, whether it's something around research or fundraising or community building, whatever the case may be, something that you think uh, might bring value to the community that we could discuss and work on, or just wanting to talk about something that you're experiencing. You know, we want this to be just very communal. And as Laura and I were talking about it, it was kind of, how do we take some of these conversations out of Facebook and make them more personable, all right? And actually like communicate with a human, uh, although although virtually um, there is a big difference. There's a lot more value I find in actually seeing people's faces and like you can just tell tone better and it just, it creates better dialogue, I think. I think Facebook's not necessarily the best communication medium. Um, so with that said, I want to introduce today, we're gonna talk with Zoe Frazier. So Zoe, is the genetic counselor at the Cleaster Clinic. And one of the big efforts of iDefine and what's something that we recognized that we needed from the very like very start was creating this center of excellence, so to speak. And that's what the Cleaster Clinic essentially is. And Zoe in her role, which we'll get to, plays a very critical component of that. And with a lot of the communication that's happened and folks that have gone to the Cleaster Clinic, what we wanted to do is you know, you see a lot of businesses and organizations do this meet the team format. And so we want to let you all get to know Zoe, you know, what makes her tick, what, why she's in her role. And so we felt like this was a cool opportunity to get to know. So Zoe, with that, I want to kick off and just kind of ask you to tell us about your background. What led you to becoming the genetic counselor at the Cleaster Clinic? Yeah, so it's lovely to meet everybody. Um, so I actually grew up in Massachusetts, so around the Boston area. Um, I went to Kenyon College out in Ohio, where I got a degree in biology and also studied anthropology. And after completing my degree, I came back to Boston. Um, so you can see a theme. I love Boston. <laughs> um, but I worked at Dana-Farber for three years doing cancer research, and I really enjoyed doing research. But I realized after three years of staring at my cells um, and doing all these experiments that I really missed the component of working with other people. Um, so I, that's how I found genetic counseling is I met with the genetic counselors um, at Dana-Farber and I realized that genetic counseling was this really cool career where there was a combination of working directly with patients who are going through the diagnostic odyssey, um, so doing the clinical work, also doing research, we were able to do be a part of research initiatives, um, and then also there's a large advocacy component, so working with nonprofits like I Define, um, depending on your area of specialty. Um, and so I ended up going to Boston University for their genetic counseling program, and I graduated in May with my master's. Um, and during my graduate career, I worked at the Undiagnosed Diseases Network. So I had a lot of exposure to helping people apply to that research protocol and then also um, help them navigate that diagnostic odyssey because a lot of these families have been doing testing for years and they've never found anything. Um, so the UDN is this really cool research project where a lot of that comes together. And, and I think there's about a 40% diagnostic rate, which was really, really um, a powerful experience to be a part of. Um, but this position really helped me discover my love for working with rare disease populations. So that's why I actually applied for this position at Children's. Awesome. You know, when we were talking about this previously, Zoe, it was like how many of our families that have Klaipstra were at one point part of that undiagnosed, you know, undiagnosed population, like so many, right? Like so many. it warrants, yeah. you know, it, it seems like it should be a natural 
um, relationship for, especially with your role now, that we should partner with them and talk with them and, and just gain some visibility uh, within that undiagnosed disease network? Um, because there's so many, um, and there's so many rare diseases and so many are undiagnosed and so many experience that diagnostic odyssey that I think there's an opportunity there for, for us just to say, hey, you know, we're one organization, but there is organizations out there for, for you. If you can kind of dig deeper and get that diagnosis, um, it's really, really helpful. Um, and before everyone was uh, let into the, the conversation, we were, we were having a sidebar conversation about your current role, uh, being a genetic counselor and, and what that means, right? Because it's, uh, it's just, uh, I think, pointed enough, but it still leaves a little bit of ambiguity. Um, so, and even me, when we were talking, you know, I, I don't think I realized necessarily the full size and scope of what your position was. And so I'd love for you to kind of detail a little bit of your roles and responsibilities now that you are, you know, the genetic counselor of the Kleepster Clinic. Yeah. So as I mentioned, genetic counselors work in clinical space and also research spaces. So we're trained, um, kind of a broad overview is we're trained to help people undergo or families go through the genetic testing um, process. So a lot of the families we see in the Cleveland Clinic have already gone through that process, but a lot of families haven't had the opportunity to talk about or like really dive into like what that meant for them and like go through their genetic testing reports. So um, that's one part of my job, but essentially so at Children's, I'm in the Department of Neurology um, and half of my time is dedicated to the Cleveland Clinic, um, which was just established officially um, in mid-June. So we're two months old, um, which is really exciting to be really like starting at the ground level and helping doctors sit to build it up. Um, but my role in the clinical space um, is to be that initial contact for families. So um, basically I've created this letter. So when we have a new family that comes to the clinic, we'll send them the letter with the list of all of the specialty providers that we've, we've partnered with, and they can go through and they can kind of specialize their clinical experience with us. Um, so right now it's Dr. Sid in neurology, um, Dr. O'Donnell in genetics, and then me in genetic counseling, that's like the core team. And then we also have partnerships with providers who are in ophthalmology, sleep medicine, gastroenterology, um, auto, otolaryngology, so ear, nose, throat, um, and then, oh, psychiatry. And we're currently in talks with um, trying to get someone in cardiology and also pulmonology. Um, so basically it's my job to help people like understand what this clinic is, help them specialize what they would like. Um, and then once we've had that conversation, introduce them to our scheduler, Mani, who will help facilitate the insurance check ahead of time. So no one's stuck with an astronomical bill, um, no surprise bills, <laughs> and then, um, then help them schedule a visit with Dr. Sid. And then I also set them up with other schedulers in these other departments to try and, and make an established clinic day or, or several days of clinical visits. Um, and then also as a part of the team, I do provide the genetic counseling. So um, if people have questions about their genetic test reports or if they never had time to like process that diagnosis, that's a part of my job is to make space for that. And then the other part of my job with the Cleveland Clinic is research. So these are separate entities, even though it's me and Sid, um, we both have a really strong interest in clinical care and then also doing research. Um, so right now I'm in charge of recruiting families to be a part of the, the natural history study that we have right now. Um, when I first started, when I joined in June, it had been led by someone named Jackie and there was a large backlog of families that had been contacted in the past possibly. Um, so the first month of me being here was really reaching out to everybody and making sure I reintroduced myself, made sure that, you know, if you're interested, this is my contact, I'm happy to set up a call to talk, um, just to make sure that everyone who wants to participate has the opportunity to really get on board. Um, and then in order to enroll participants, we have just like a few um, inclusion criteria. So one is a genetic testing report showing a, like a genetic change or a large deletion in EHMT1. Um, they have to commit to doing the two years um, or clinical visits. They can be remote or in person. Um, and then also their child has to be 13 years or older. Um, right now we're kind of aiming for actually 18 to 25, just for that post puberty time period, trying to really get a sense of, you know, after puberty, what does this progression look like? Um, but we, we definitely, 
are in talks with families who are 13 and older. Um, so right now, sorry, this is long-winded. There's a lot to my job. <laughs> um, so right now, a study visit, um, kind of what a study day looks like, um, is you, you meet with me first and we do an official consent. So we go through the consent form and really talk about what the study means, what it entails. Um, and then also we review the genetic testing report, which is kind of what I do in clinic, but I also want to make sure anyone who comes to the study also has the chance to talk about that. Um, there's also a clinical intake visit with Dr. Sid. So he makes sure if you're not a patient already at Children's, make sure that we really have your, you know, a lot of the information that Dr. Kleefster wants us to collect um, medical records wise. And then lastly, there's neuropsych testing. So we have, this all happens in the same building, which is really convenient. So people will just go upstairs to the fifth floor where we have a neuropsych team. It's this pair that they're really nice and approachable um, and their activities for our participants, for our kids, and then parents do a questionnaire. Um, there's also the option for a remote study visit for those who can't travel right now in the midst of the pandemic, or it's also really difficult to travel in general. So um, we do offer this as um, an option to make this more accessible to everybody. Um, and unfortunately though, the neuropsych team can't do the online activities um, with, the, with the kids, with the participants, but we do um, collect all the other information. So you'd meet with me, meet with Dr. Sid, and then also do like parent questionnaires. Um, and Dr. Kleefster feels like that's enough data for their study. Um, yeah. Well, I think it, it, it's safe to say that uh, you have a pretty full plate, right? And I think that the it's busy. The, the role <laughs> the role is is pretty encompassing. But I think you know to draw out a couple of highlights um, from what you just said it is is one just the, as it relates to our community is communication, right? That, that we can recognize that as a newly formed clinic, there and and with a clinic that has experienced some transition, that's kind of the nature of the beast. There's there's every organization. It feels like in the world right now is experiencing transition for, for a variety of reasons, right? But it's it's something that happens, right? And one of the, the, the biggest challenges whenever there's a transition is communication. And so we've had some challenges around communication, but I think it's important to highlight that what you your approach was is to kind of, you know, gather all the information before just starting to get, you know, conduct outreach, right? We needed to kind of, as you stepped into this role, get an understanding of the playing field and then start having a strategy rolled out. And I think that it's, it's the smart way to do things and it's the most sustainable way. Um, so we can acknowledge that there might've been some hiccups during that transition period, but now it's all about kind of setting up this system, right? That can be almost self-propelling to a degree and we won't have those same kind of issues. So just that, like any, anything new, you, you work through some of your, your onboarding hiccups um, you you work through those in, in a very kind of polite, respectful manner, uh, and then you you build right. And so I think that was one of the big takeaways. And then also something else that you you mentioned was this study being eighteen to twenty five. And I think it's important to highlight, you know, when folks hear the name Boston Children's Hospital, I think a lot of parents are drawn to the children's right, and then they think that this is a limiting uh, organization. And I think it was important for you to highlight the fact that you're talking about patients right now from eighteen to twenty five, right? Like this is this is inclusive, right? Like we, we want it to be more inclusive. I, I've been a proponent, for instance, of saying that we need to start gathering data from, you know, day one, you know, when a child is born, we want to start gathering that data. Yeah. But th that's a separate discussion, I think, for, for the purposes of, of this point is to highlight the fact that this isn't, you know, just an adolescent and under that, you know, you're talking 18 to 25. Um, and I think that, you know, having this kind of relationship where it's not limiting, for, for those patients with KS is, is really important. So um, I appreciate you kind of providing that context. Um, other things I wanted to hit on just to, you know, I think what's important when we meet somebody, you know, in your position who comes into now our family, our community, you know, it's like, what's your why? What's your driver? You know, what, what's, what do you think? Like what, what's fulfilling you? And, and I, I think you hit on it a little bit about why you've kind of switched your own roles, but I'll let you answer is like, what's the fulfilling part of your role? Yeah. So I originally took this job because of my experiences with the UDN. Um, and I really wanted to work with a patient population after the diagnostic odyssey. So really helping them like through the treatment and the care process. Um, but basically why I continue to really enjoy my job um, is that 
I think this is a really exciting time to be a part of the Kleestra community, um, both in the care and the research aspects of everything. Um, we know so much more now than we did even a few years ago, when I first actually Googled what Cleefstra was when the job was posted, there wasn't that much compared to even now. Um, and so we're, we're learning so much, honestly, every day, every month, like every time we have a new person come to the clinic, that really expands Dr. Sid and I's knowledge about Cleefstra. Um, and, you know, we're hoping to continue to learn more about the progression of Cleefstra treatment guidelines. And then we also are really working in our research role towards developing and uh, future therapy and doing clinical trials for that. That's a huge goal of ours. Yeah. Um, I've also been in the research side of things really struck by the selflessness of this patient population in particular, um, you know, like in this natural history study setting. Um, these are often families who, you know, their child has had Cleefster for maybe up to two or three decades. They, you know, they did not get a diagnosis until a few years ago. Um, and they are the families that had to continuously advocate for their child every, like throughout their entire lives and really fight for their, you know, for their, you know, rights and for their services and, and to help them lead the best possible life they have. And I've met so many families that just have finally gotten an answer, but, you know, it's, it's, it's been a really long road. Um, but now these same people are dedicating their time to paying it forward to the young, younger generation. Because, I mean, I just got contacted by a family that said, my child is six months old and was just diagnosed with this. We don't know what to do. And we're meeting with them next month. Um, and, and the research that the families of the, the older generation of Cleestra kids, they are paying it forward to that child. And it's, it's really powerful to see the research, be a part of the research and then also be a part of the clinical care and knowing like this child's life will be so much, I think easier than, than it would have been, you know, five, 10 years ago. Um, also, you know, as I mentioned, Dr. Sid and I are learning so much and he couldn't be here today, but he really wanted me to relay the message that it has been such a positive experience working with this patient population. And he is dedicating, you know, his career, he's basing his career off of, of this, this, this clinic. Um, and he feels very grateful and also very I think, humbled is a good way to put it of how many people have come to us and have been willing to share their, their lived experiences um, and, you know, share their, their diagnostic experience with us um, because that really does help us grow as a clinic. And also it helps us treat future kids with Cleopatra. Yeah. Um, well, I think um, again, like, the space is rapidly developing, you know, for, for all of rare diseases, but specifically for Cleefstra. I mean, the amount of stuff taking place right now is incredibly exciting. And that's, you know, from an organizational standpoint, as well as just international community, as, as we see different things happening, there is, Cleefstra syndrome is starting to be recognized, I think. And before it, it wasn't right. And, and we're still not at the point where, you know, a parent, a new, you know, newly diagnosed parent is asked like, what, you know, what's the condition your child has? And they say Cleefstra syndrome. And the person's like, oh yeah, I've heard of that. We're not there yet. Right. There's still, there's still plenty of work to be done, but there's going to be a day where that does happen. Like yes. that is, that is, that is our motivation where this isn't kind of one of those hidden conditions that our child, you know, isn't one that, you know, is kind of not on the map, right? Or is, is put, there's a mom in Australia, Vanessa, who is, uses the phrase that her, her daughter will never be put in the too hard bucket, right? Like we, the, the, yeah. too hard to be able to give attention to like, no, like we're, we're putting this effort and this, this cause front and center and we're demanding attention, right? I think that's, yeah. that's pretty cool. And I agree with the selflessness is we've, we've deemed it like a legacy, you know, committee is like, there's a lot of families that have walked this road that was much, much harder than it is today, right? There's so many shared learnings and now they're paying it forward. And that's, it's incredibly value, valuable because we, we talk a lot about where we are right now as a condition and as an organization, there's not going to be a whole lot of people from outside of the Cleaster syndrome community who are going to come into it to help us. We're not at that stage. We're gonna reach a point where that does happen. But from right now, we have to pull 
the strength from our entire community, from, from folks that have been in it for a while to the folks that are newly diagnosed and everybody in between. We need to all be pulling together and lift our voice collectively. And then we're gonna start attracting that outside you know, presence and, and help hopefully. Uh, but where we are right now is is we're dependent upon each other for our own success, right? And so we have this incredibly beautiful opportunity with the space developing so rapidly to capitalize on this moment. And it's going to take, you know, those folks being so selfless to help out. So um, pretty cool. So with that said, like, what are your... What are some goals that you have for, for you know, your, you specifically, as well as for the Cleaster Clinic? Yeah, so I think for the Cleaster Clinic, you know, as I mentioned, we've only existed for officially two months. So although Dr. Sid has seen patients before then, I'm really working on developing a really streamlined and efficient way for people who come in with a lot of questions and a lot of uncertainty to feel like, okay, you've come to the right place. We have this well-oiled machine for you to see as many specialists as you feel that you need. Um, so that starts with the intake letter and then the follow-up call, really making sure that we make that contact with families um, and then coordinating a visit day or several visit days where every, every specialist is able to be seen. Um, and then for the, the research study, I'm really trying to continue to enroll as many participants as possible. Um, Dr. Kleefstra, because of just, I think COVID really caused some hiccups and everything, but the study was shortened from two years to three or from three years to two years. So I'm trying to enroll as many people as I can possibly talk to. Um, so people have been getting a lot of cold emails from me. <laughs> like, um, so anyway, I'm trying to enroll as many people as possible. Um, and then, yeah, that requires, you know, there are certain rules and regulations when it comes to working with with uh, human humans, yeah, we can't just, you know, we, we have to, there's a limited amount of times I can contact people. So that's limited to about two to three times. So um, I'm truly trying to keep up that communication, but in a respectful way with, with people who might be interested in the study. Um, and then- Yeah, I think that's, Rook, I don't mean to interrupt, but I think oh, that's so worth repeating. You know, there is a, a, a limiting factor to how many times you can contact someone in our community, right? So yeah. it's incumbent upon us at, at, to reach out to you all, right? Because if, if you're, you can't solicit basically, right? I mean, there's, yeah. there's like parameters and there's like privacy that you are regulated by. And I think that's an important uh, point to just make sure that, that folks hear and understand. Yeah, our contact list for the study is made up of people who have reached out to us in the past um, and also people that we've seen in the clinic who meet that criteria. So if if we haven't heard from you and we haven't seen you in clinic, we, we don't know that you're out there. We don't know how else to find you. So we, and I also, yeah, like I, I can't just cold email people who I see on, you know, on the internet, on Instagram, who they their kid has cleaved I can't just cold email you. It has to be kind of initiated either from your end or you have to be seen in the clinic. There are certain I rules can. and laws I have to follow, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, there are some restraints, but I think, you know, I think this is, a, as I said before, this is a, a really hopeful time to be in Cleveland research because there is such a willingness to participate. Um, and then, Lastly, we, we're really working towards developing, as you mentioned, there is a need for doing research with kids who are younger than 13. And we recognize that and we're really driven to do that. Um, so we're working actually on developing a protocol right now that's similar to the current study for children who are younger than 13. So we're thinking probably starting at like two or three until maybe up to 18 actually to really catch that, that population of, of children that have Kleefstra. Um, and, you know, with the combination, this kind of goes into like updates that we have for the future, but in order to develop a study that involves a drug, we have to know how this, this condition progresses. So we can know, does this drug actually help or is it actually not doing anything? So we really have to collect data now on all these different ages um, in order to know if you start with this drug at 13, does it actually change the progression at all? Or is this, this drug not adding any benefit to people's lives? So we're really trying to catch as many aged or as large of an age population as possible. Um, and we're currently working on 
on developing that protocol right now, actually. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the work that we're doing now is so incredibly important to lay out the future, right? If, if we want to, you know, the, the idea of, of research and developing a therapeutic and having an, an intervention to help our kids, there is a very rigorous process it has to go through, right? And for it to be approved, we have to have the data in place, right? So this is kind of that fundamental work that needs to be done in order for us to show that this is going to have an impact in the development of endpoints. And you, we can go off on a, a unbelievably, you know, go down a deep dab, rabbit hole uh, talking about data and endpoints and how all this kind of ties in. I think it warrants a discussion at some point. Uh, but for today, I think it's, it's just important to stress like this kind of year over year longitudinal data, like did your, your child, you know, walk this year for the first time or what happened there or, you know, whatever any of the other kind of potential phenotypes that have been expressed, um, being able to get those documented is, is incredibly important. So, um, and you, you kind of uh, alluded to it, but as kind of a final thought, um, any updates to provide uh, right now as it relates to the Cleavester Clinic and, and moving forward? Yeah, so as of August, 2021, Sid has seen 43 Cleavester families um, and we're starting actually to schedule follow-up visits now, which is really exciting. So we're having returning or patients. Um, and then for the research study, we have enrolled um, three families so far, and we have two more coming up next week and the following week. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, and then I'm also in talks with many other families, which is, you know, it's really exciting to be able to do the in-person and also remote options for everybody. Um, and then lastly, as I mentioned, we are still working on the, the protocol for kids that are younger than 13. Um, and in this planning stage, we're really trying to be incredibly thoughtful about what tests and what data we're collecting. Um, so that involves the nice thing about being, or the very fortunate thing about being at Boston Children's is we are surrounded by a huge community of specialists. Um, so we're really trying to work with that expertise and knowledge at Children's. So we've been meeting with various special specialists to say, okay, we wanna do this research study. Kids with Kleefstra tend to have these features. What are the best tests? What's the best you know, medical records? What's the best type of sleep study? What's the best type of you know, autism study that we should be collecting from them um, to get, as you mentioned, kind of those endpoints um, to make sure that we can make the best possible case for that next step for a clinical trial instead of natural history studies. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think those are the main updates as of August, 2021. Awesome. I mean, well, just from my perspective, y'all having seen 43 families is remarkable. I mean, when we, you know, when we first started, this was our first initiative as, as an organization was to launch the Cleavester Clinic, right? And your partnership, you know, that, that we, we soft kind of opened where you all were seeing people before we, you know, before you were actually even onboarded. Yeah. Right? So like yeah. there, there's been a lot of just giving from, from the folks at the Cleaster Clinic team, which has been incredible, but just in my mind, like not knowing that there wasn't a place in the United States prior to BCH that was like this centralized hub of information where there was a team focused on KS2 you know, 11 months later, almost a full year later, having that same team, like be built out and see 43 families, like that's dramatic. That, that's a, that's a yeah. big deal. And I think it's also important to highlight that you all have been driving blind to a degree. Like we're just now starting to develop a guideline for KS. I mean, that's, that's a current effort underway. It's an international effort, you know, that we are, you know, you mentioned cardiology and pulmonology. It's like, there's a, a current conversation going on in the Facebook pages right now about this, right? And oh, okay. there's not enough information. Like there was a paper written three years ago, but there's no one who's like the expert. Like we need to take that information and this communication out of the Facebook page and drop it into a cardiology like component of the clinic and pulmonology, yeah. right? Where we can actually have recorded data outside of a Facebook page that we can actually do something with and develop like expert care, yeah. right? So when a, next time the family has that question in a year from now, it's like, oh, this is the doctor who, who has done work in this and who you can go see. Like it's, it's an evolution that is necessary for us to improve the care 
for patients with Clijsters yeah. syndrome, right? And so um, that that uh, effort, I know I see Julie here, she's gonna be a part of the effort. We have patient representatives in these 10 different working groups from, you know, um, from from sleep to to, hey, to <laughs> genetic counseling to everything, um, we're going to have both you know clinical experts as well as parent representatives from across the world participating in these working groups to develop this guideline. Like that is going to be a book that then not only will the Clevester Clinic be able to work off of, but if a family in you know in, in Idaho you know, gets a diagnosis and their, 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 their team of doctors has no idea what to do, this guideline is going to be publicly available. So that they'll yeah. be able to look at that as opposed to printing off the same Google document that everybody on this call has been given um, from Nord or Guard or somewhere like that. It's, yeah. it's actually going to be a, a Cleefstra focused guideline that's been developed to actually provide better care. So that's, that's awesome. And right now we actually feel a lot of inquiries from other providers from like Kansas. They're like, I've never heard of this before. I Googled it. I don't know anything, but I Googled it and your name, your email popped up. What do I, what can you tell us? And we're really excited to share the information that we've learned from the clinic with those, with those providers. So this is something that I think we do need very clear clinical guidelines. And I'm really excited to work towards developing those. Um, but we, we are already seeing a need and people reaching out to us saying, I'm a provider, but you know, part of being a really good provider is admitting when I don't know something and I don't know what this is, will you please help us? Um, so we, we have been working with you know, people's providers and also just general clinicians reaching out to us. Awesome, yeah, I think that's, that's one way to kind of circumnavigate some of the uh, insurance challenges that people have experienced, right? Is if, if you can't, get to BCH or if BCH cannot uh, see you virtually, that you have the potential to have your your clinical team uh, reach yeah. out and touch base. And yes. that that is that is 100% within regulation that they could actually talk with, with you or, or Dr. Sid about these things. Yes. And that's what we've been doing. If people are like, we want to come in person to the clinic, but right now flying is just not feasible, but we don't you know, we can't be part of the study, we can't get to you. Um, what we say is please connect us with your doctors and we can talk about what we can do for right now. And then eventually if you can come in and meet with us, that would be awesome. But we were happy to share our knowledge with anyone's providers. Awesome. Well, Zoe, I wanna thank you for your time. Uh, really great just to get you in front of everybody. Um, and hello, well, is it accurate that you cannot private pay at the clinic? That is not accurate. Uh, you can certainly private pay. Uh, there was some miscommunication uh, within the Facebook page that, um, yeah, so you can private pay. Um, there was some miscommunication. I, let me clarify that. It was miscommunication within the Cleaster Clinic, and then it was also miscommunication in the Facebook page that never really got, um, I guess, uh, retracted appropriately and corrected. Uh, but just for clarification, there is private pay potential with BCH. So, and with um, any type of um, insurance issue that comes up, we've actually been in contact with financial counselors at Boston Children's who are very willing and excited to work with anyone who has questions about insurance or, you know, self-pay or other financial options. So we do have that, um, that system set up as well. Yep. And I would, uh, just like, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, I was going to plug another effort that we're working on. Um, we actually have a host of us uh, parents that are actually getting together about creating a resource document about medical necessity and medical billing, uh, and specifically as it relates to BCH as well. Uh, but we're, there's there's a parent coalition that's working on this. So if anybody has interest, reach out to me, and we'll get you plugged into that effort because we want we want to make sure it's it's really crystallized and everybody understands it going into it. Yeah. So. Well, Zoe, thank you very much. Uh, look forward to, to more chats with you. Uh, yeah. And yeah, just appreciate your time today. Oh, of course. It was really nice to see you um, and see everybody. Hello to people here live or also on the recording. Um, uh, yeah, I think Jeff will share our clinic's email and feel free to reach out. That email is me. That's me. <laughs> and I'm happy to talk to anyone via email, on the phone, on Zoom. Just let me know. I'm happy to connect. Awesome. Thank you, Zoe. Have a great day, everybody.